Ruth and I used to take the bus together, and she was a little bit younger than me, so we went from the bus, taking the bus to the comp in Selkirk, the high school, to now here we are uh, running a great, you know, hanging out at the university. So here we are. Running, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not running, you're running it, really is what I'm trying to say. I just follow your coattails. Uh, my rule is just follow what Ruth says and show up. So, uh, so this is uh, some of the work that I do in the community. So, for doing my mother and I'm going to do the cost now. 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 Uh, I share and that I talk about, and um, I only have a little bit amount of time, but uh, I, I sort of, I want to move quickly into what I'm here to talk about today, which is to make the grandiose suggestion to you that Anishinaabe, uh, which are my people, but they also mean human humans generally, that you are part of that as well, uh, it will save the world. And what, is, what do I mean by that? Well, uh, we first got to understand what the Anishinaabe uh, represent and the work that the Anishinaabe people who are been a part of this territory for thousands of years. Um, we most recently have settled in the southern Manitoba parts uh, after a very long migration starting in about 1000 AD, uh, moving westward from our original homelands in the Abenaki Confederacy, near the Abenaki Confederacy, traveling through the Great Lakes ending off in various places along the way, which they said to be seven stopping places along the way, and one of those stopping places uh, being that now heading out to the west, and we have Anishinaabe as far west as northern Alberta even, so this map even is slightly uh, not completely accurate to what the Anishinaabe nation might be. What I always say about Anishinaabe, the best way I can define the Anishinaabe is we didn't need the United Nations, we already had it. So however, you, wherever you stand in the Anishinaabe Nation, you are Anishinaabe from that place, but you're also part of this grand Anishinaabe, which is defined by several different words. Uh, there's several different ways to, to translate the word Anishinaabe, but the way that I like to describe it is to use the William Ward's 1885 definition, which is the spontaneous people. Some people interpret it as the good people, some people interpret it as the people who were lowered, but uh, I like to interpret it as the spontaneous people. We are people who are continually in the process of becoming, meaning that spontaneity is when you see something or think something or decide you're going to go to Minneapolis for the weekend or, or decide you're going to get flowers for someone or, or you determine that you're going to make this turn instead of that turn. It only happens because of cause. Spontaneity doesn't happen randomly. Spontaneity is due to cause. You have an experience, a thought, an idea, and then you choose to follow that idea. That's what the Anishinaabe are. We're in this continually process of becoming Anishinaabe. If I were to say to you, there's no finished Anishinaabe, we are only in the process of becoming Anishinaabe. And that process is an un eternal, unfinished process. So part of that is within the stories that we tell as Anishinaabe ourselves. And one of the most important stories that we tell is our prophecy story. And I don't have time to tell you that story, uh, but the prophecy story talks about uh, at 1100, we had a vision of seven prophets who came to us, who emerged from the seawater. And there's lots of different stories. Sometimes they're called the seven grandfathers. Sometimes they're, se they're called the seven gifts. But the seven prophets... And what they, we were informed was, is that our homelands in the east were to be inhabited, we'll say. Some might say occupied, some might say invaded, but by various peoples. And so we were to begin a journey and to travel in that journey, which would take seven fires. And on the seventh fire of that journey, we would meet many different people along the fire of, of that journey. But on the seventh fire of that journey... Um, the seventh prophet turned to the Anishinaabe and was somewhat different than the other prophets. Uh, his eyes were glowing and he brought a message not only to the Indians but also the light-skinned race. He said, at the, sun, at the time of the seventh fire, a new people will emerge. They will retrace the footsteps of their ancestors and try to find those things which have been lost along the way. They will approach the elders in search of guidance. And they will become what will be called the 
Ashki Anishinaabe, which are the new Anishinaabe. Now, the word Ashki is an important word because it's also a word that we use to describe fire. So they are Anishinaabe who are in the process of growing. They are people who uh, we might look at today and say, well, where are these Ashki Anishinaabe? Uh, where can we, what can we define them as? And where might we be able to recognize them? What do they look like? What are they doing? Are they amongst us? I feel like I'm describing an alien movie. Yeah. <laughs> are they amongst us? Now, my PhD research is in uh, Ojibwe literature. And so my work is in Anishinaabe literature, literary history, going back to thousands of years because this is going to shock or maybe not shock you whatsoever, but Anishinaabe writing did not begin with Europeans. It began with thousands and thousands of years of semiotic texts written on things like rock and birch bark and, and skin and sand. Um, and, you know, on, uh, on uh, in fact, the very first encounter by Columbus what I, that I teach my students is, I, uh, is I, I tell my students, what does Columbus notice on the very first day? Well, he notices markings on the skin. In fact, he says, they are painted black like the canaries. And then what he says immediately following that is, they are fit to be servants. Well, what that tells me is that Columbus was illiterate. He could not read the writing that indigenous peoples were presenting to him, which were markings on their body, their hairstyles, their expressions that they had within the very scars that they carried, which are all semiotics. Those are all texts. And so my work in, is in Anishinaabe literature. And so uh, the course that I'm teaching, and some of my students are here, uh, the course that I'm teaching, we begin with the very first Anishinaabe creation story, which talks about writing, how writing comes to creation, how Yeje Manadu created writing on the very first moment of creation. In fact, the first sound of creation is a text. And so as we begin to talk about what Anishinaabe literature is, we start there, but I'm here to talk to you a little bit about Kakawakanabe, who is the first Ojibwe uh, Methodist missionary to write in English in the 1830s. Now this is his book right here called The History of the Ojibwe Native Indians, which is, was published posthumously in the 1850s after he passed away. But uh, Peter Jones was most famously known for being the first Ojibwe to write in English and then also bring other Anishinaabe in southern Ontario, places like Rice Lake and Burlington Heights and what we now call Hamilton in Toronto and places like that, Mississauga. He was a Mississauga Anishinaabe. And what he offered was the idea that Christianity could offer a view out of the trauma in which he was living in. Uh, the radical idea that he had offered that at the time of flooding in this period, and what he saw growing up, was the absolute decimation of Anishinaabe territories. For the most part, from 1763, the time of the Royal Proclamation, when the King George III said, everything is mine, and then the British acted accordingly, uh, and all the way to the War of 1812, which was the decimation, the final kind of um, moment in which Anishinaabe uh, were turning to federal authorities, or what was soon to become Canada, at that time, Upper Canada, and were having their lands decimated before their very eyes. Trees were being mowed down for cities. Uh, there was almost no ability to hunt and fish left. In fact, Peter Jones tells stories of his first vision quest as traveling out with men who cannot find game. And so what they do instead is they choose to drink to cope with the trauma of the world in which they lived around them. And so he himself off grows up with no mentorship, no mentorship from uncles or from, from men. The only person that he has is his mother. Does this sound familiar for any of the contemporary circumstances involving indigenous young men? Uh, this is exactly the kind of work that I do today in masculinity. Now, the, the experiences of, of Kakawakanabe, uh, sacred waving feathers, all in his English name is Peter Jones, was what that he witnessed the apocalypse of Anishinaabe life in southern Ontario, but yet found ways out of that apocalypse. He found ways in which Anishinaabe were acting resiliently. He also found ways in which Anishinaabe could find venues in the most direst of circumstances, particularly in Christianity, whereas at the time, uh, as I've said many times, the problem with Christianity is ultimately the Christians, because the Bible itself, is quite a, uh, uh, a, an inclusive document. It says things like love and respect and, and honor people, but it is the Christians who said things like burn the drums, forget your names, we're going to take your children and decide you're not good enough to parent. Peter Jones said that the problem with, the Chris, with Christianity is not the Bible itself, because the Bible itself is similar to Nishinaabe. And what he said was, is that I'm going to convert to uncover 
the ways in which the Bible has failed Christianity, or Christians uh, generally. Why do Christians drink so much, for example? He would ask that question. Uh, he would he'd say, why is it that Christians, uh, when they turn to indigenous peoples, are so violent? Why do they inhabit the land in such a draconian, brutal way? Now, one of the things that uh, Peter Jones did within his lifetime was he believed thoroughly in the process of literacy. He believed that Anishinaabe should learn English, and he should, they should learn how to read and write in English. And one observation that he made in the 1840s, uh, amongst a sermon that he was giving, uh, among, in England actually, arguing for funding for uh, Ojibwe schools, is he said, it makes the heart of the poor Indian rejoice to see his child read in a book, to see him put the talk to paper, and to see the talk go to a distance. That makes him rejoice. I will give you one instance. At the River Credit, we had a station. A chief had a son who was instructed in our mission school after he was employed as a teacher in another school and went away more than 100 miles from his father. After a time, he wrote a letter to his father in the Indian tongue, which he did not know how to read. The father brought it to me to read to, to read for him, and while I read, the tears ran down his eyes, and he rejoiced to hear the talk of his son on the paper at a distance. Now, there's so much remarkableness in this passage. Uh, the first is that Peter Jones is traveling to England to argue for Anishinaabe schools to say that Anishinaabe writing in their own language continues relationships, builds relationships, uh, most importantly, continues relationships between a boy and his father. Second, he is seeing the possibility of English text in the creation of those schools as a continuance of Anishinaabe, not the end of it. Thirdly, he's making an argument to say that writing does amazing things. Where does he get that from? writing systems that have already been in existence for Anishinaabe for a very long period of time. And fourthly, he is seeing and showing others the Oshki Anishinaabe. He is showing to others what Anishinaabe are being, which is spontaneously in a position of creation. They are learning English, they are using paper, they are communicating to each other over great distances. We might call that phones, we might call that the internet, we might call it emailing of today. The Oshki Anishinaabe, we can see by simply looking around this room. You know, this year we have a 2550 or 2450? 2550 self-declared indigenous students. Now, when my father was going here in the late 1970s, my father used to tell me stories of what it was like to come to the University of Manitoba. And he would start like this. He'd say, it was the loneliest, loneliest experience that I ever had in my life because I never saw another brown face. Now, it wasn't there wasn't brown faces here, because Obi Mekrity was finishing his law degree at the time. Uh, Marion Ironquill, to be need more, was also doing her work here at the time. Ken Young was here at the time. There were many people who were doing work here at the time. My father came to school here to become a lawyer, but he, he went to school, and not only did he have to never see an indigenous face, but he had to study the most racist decisions, which are what creates this country's laws. Things like, Indigenous peoples don't have any land rights. Uh, things like Indigenous peoples don't exist, they don't have civilized behavior. Or uh, things like uh, uh, Indigenous peoples don't have rights that go beyond the, the time of European contact, which, by the way, is still here. It is still a principle. Uh, so law is built on precedent. And so my dad was encountering this wall of whiteness upon encountering that. Uh, and so, no surprise, there were no Indigenous people here. There was, you know, maybe 10 at the time of 1970 when the uh, Indian Métis, uh, in, sorry, Indian Métis Student Association began, uh, there was only about a dozen. And then around my dad's time, there's probably around 20 throughout the 1980s, maybe 100 through the 1990s, maybe a couple hundred, if that. And now we have 25, 50. That's remarkable. Like, we almost make 10% of the university. 10% of the university. And so that resembles very much the arrival of indigenous peoples into the mainstream, but the fact that it, remain, the fact that it remains is that uh, it really tells us two things. One is that indigenous peoples are the fastest growing population in our community, particularly in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. But what it actually tells you is it's safe for the first time in history to call yourself indigenous. That's what it actually tells you. 
Like, so I get students all the time who come up to me and say, I think I'm Métis, or I think I'm Anishinaabe. And I say, well, what is it that makes you think that? And they'll say, usually an ancestor. Or, but they might say someone, something like, um, I know this, I know this person who knows this person who knows this story about my family. Or, um, I've done this research involving my family and my family inhabited this territory, but we never talked about it. So we at the University of Manitoba are having this incredible awakening amongst our student population, and what do we do with it? It's complicated, it's not as easy to say that I'm simply indigenous on a Friday, because it's not about who you claim, it's who claims you. That's why when I say, the next thing I say to my students is that's an amazing story, but now the work begins. Because now your job is, is to go out and make connections. Uh, like my auntie said to me one time, I uh, got my PhD and I went to my auntie's house, and I said, hey auntie, look, I'm a doctor now. And she handed me an axe and said, okay, go cut some wood there, doctor. <laughs> and then I was chopping the wood in the backyard, and she opened the door, and she said, uh, how's that dissertation coming? I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's your, you know, individual credentials or claiming something means nothing if you are not claimed. And that's what Anishinaabe is all about. So at the University of Manitoba, we're trying to do here, particularly in the Department of Native Studies, but I would say incredible people like the uh, people at the Indigenous Achievement Office, people at Megas Yegamek, people in Access, people in all different faculties, amazing professors like Warren Carew and the other people throughout faculties throughout the, throughout the university, um, are doing amazing things believing in students. Like when we believe in students and we walk with them, whatever stage of the journey that they're at, uh, it, remarkable things begin to happen. Like I could just talk about my students all day. This is a little bit of a dated, because you can see Aboriginal Student Association, but I don't know if you remember Nathan Legacy, so he's now a faculty member or a, a professor, instructor over at the University of Winnipeg. He was my master's student. Um, he did a, I brought him from undergrad all the way up to his master's degree, and now he's thinking about doing his PhD. Uh, he just finished his master's degree last summer on indigenous video games both representations of Indigenous peoples and then how Indigenous peoples have used video games to revitalize language, reconnect themselves with land, make land claims. Uh, do you know how many people have a graduate degree in Indigenous video games? One. <laughs> There's Nathan and then a woman named Elizabeth Lapense who's at Michigan State University. And she didn't really work on video games, she just worked on things like semiotics. And, and so, that's the kind of, when you make space, remarkable things happen. Our students do amazing things. When we empower them, uh, for instance, is Angelina McLeod. She is uh, she's one of my teaching assistants. She is also doing a work right now on Show Lake 40. She's from Show Lake 40. Just won a big award for doing a movie from Show Lake 40. But she's working on a thesis on the stolen birch bark scrolls from her community. Jonathan Coachman down over here, writing on indigenous opera, indigenous music. Uh, Jerome Nipanak talking about security. Uh, Ashley Richard, who's now finished, uh, she's literally traveling the country talking about economic, ethical, indigenous economics. What I'm just trying to tell you is that I can just keep talking about people both in this side of this room, outside this room. Our students are amazing and doing amazing things that I think people could not have imagined them to do, but yet within our prophecy, they have been foretold. Now, one of the most amazing things I think happened on our campus here, uh, we had a student uh, his name, whose name was uh, uh, Braden Harper. That's what I was uh, news of Harper, uh, Garden Hill, I think. And anyways, Braden um, started working for the <coughs> Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Now he was a student in our program that went to be a student at Asper. Now when we started working for the Bombers, uh, you know the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, which of course in the stadium is over there. Um, he turned to Wade Miller, who was the CEO, and uh, and he had he had shared with him a lesson in which we had taught him in the Department of Native Studies. And one of the things that we teach in Native Studies, we, in my intro class, I say to students, I say, what's the point of football? Anybody? Like, what's the point of football? Like, what, what, what's the goal of football? What's that? I just said you got me. You got me? You're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> what's the point game? of football? What? <laughs> to win the championship game. To win the championship game? Oh. <laughs> The bombers should hire you. That's basically their message. What's the point of football? Bring people together. Oh my, that's so glass half full. <laughs> Literally the worst thing I've ever heard. Um, like, imagine the bombers lose 100 nothing. Is that, we're all together and so happy? Yeah. No. Yes, I agree with you though. I, it is about bringing people together. But we really, what's football about? It's about winning, right? Okay. Everyone's like, you know. And what, how do you win at football? You score, score touchdowns, right? Or kick a field goal. So uh, 
What you tell me is the point of football, how do you score football uh, touchdown, by the way? You have to carry the ball over the line, right? It's, there's two lines in the field. Which one? Is it this one or this one? The plan. other team's <laughs> line. So what you're telling me is that there's a line in the center of the field. It's called, this is my land, and that's your land. My job is to go into your land with peace, kindness, generosity, friendship. <laughs> <laughs> with violence. And force myself upon you. And every time I get an inch, I do a little dance. And then if I get far enough, I get six points. And just to insult you a little bit more, I'm going to kick it to see you get an extra point. And that's football. So what's football? It's called land theft. <laughs> and suddenly it got very quiet. <laughs> football is the story of land theft. That's what it is. And now, you know, before we continue, you know, baseball, what's that about? Land theft. What's hockey about? Land theft. What's basketball about? Land theft. Uh, by the way, lacrosse, invented by indigenous people, also about land theft. <coughs> to occupy someone else's territory and then penetrate the last possible space they're trying to protect. So, what do you say to yourself? You say, hey, sport's the problem, should we ban all sports? Well, no, because sports are not the problem. Stories are the problem. You know what the biggest problem or the biggest story problem in football is? If you're going to play land theft, uh, and you have decapitated Indian heads on the sides of your helmet, and you're dressed in what color? Oh yeah, blood. You're not honoring anybody. Well, you're triggering them, is what you're doing. You're actually playing out genocide, physically. Every Sunday afternoon, you can turn it on, you can watch the cowboys try to steal land from the Indians. You can physically watch it. And America loves it. Like, how many millions of people watch football? Do you watch football? I do. We have a team called the Eskimos. Like, and, they're, and the Eskimos are like, oh no, no, we're not going to change our name. And I'm like, yeah, that's the problem. The problem is you believe in the story so much that the story itself has taken over and created and affected the way that you live your life. So suddenly Indian land theft is totally legit. So before we tell that story, maybe we should talk about the best of us, which is why we say at the beginning of a bomber game, uh, we say, well, what, what we say at the beginning of a meeting is we say, we are on Treaty 1 territory, homelands of the Métis, uh, sorry, homelands of the Ojibwe, the Cree, the Dene, the Lakota, and the Dakota, we can't forget about the Lakota, um, and the homelands of the Métis Nation. That's why we do that. And then we say the second line, which is, we commit to a spirit of reconciliation moving forward. And that's what our student did with the bombers, because he was taught of what the stories are that are out there. And he went out and he changed the world. He went and said, hey, hey, bombers, we should do that. Wade's like, we should do that before, before the national anthem, even. And guess what happens? We have another sports team in the city. The sports team, uh, just down the road, one year later, after the bombers did it, the very first sports franchise, in North American history to do it because of our student. The Winnipeg Jets turned to me, called me up. I was working with them on a number of things. They said, maybe we should do a land acknowledgement. I said, why should we do it? And I told them the same story that Braden told to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Mark Chipman said, we should do this. And then now they do it in every game. Now, remember Winnipeg, now, you won't remember this this year because the Jets are kind of depressing. But <laughs> remember when they went all the way to the conference finals two years ago? 18 million people watched game six against Las Vegas. <clears throat> And how did Ron McLean from Hockey Night in Canada introduce 18 million people to Game 6? He said, welcome to Treaty 1 territory and the home of the Winnipeg Jets. And that, my friends, is how you change the world. And you do that when you believe in students, you invest in them, and you see them as the Oshki Anishinaabe. And that's one student. We got 2,449 more. 2,549 more. Uh, that's fulfilling the vision of the Oshki Anishinaabe. We're doing it all the time. You know, like, uh, here, I, I'm so proud to be part of an institution where a few things happen. I, you know, uh, I've been offered a number of jobs to go elsewhere. But one of the reasons why I stay is not just because my family is here and my history is here, but I get to teach classes where we have discussions as Anishinaabe in uh, intellectual Anishinaabe discussions in majority Anishinaabe classes. That's remarkable. Like, that is remarkable. Not many institutions can vote that. Most Native Studies programs, or most programs of uh, in which Indigenous students are a part, you're constantly at the intro level. You're only discussing the really basic stuff, because you're forced to deal with a group of people, majority of which you've only understood the Indian Act this week, or only heard of it this week, or maybe never heard of residential schools. 
or never understood that there is such a thing as an Anishinaabe intellectual tradition. Not only can we have a discussion about Anishinaabe intellectual traditions, but we can be so specific that I can talk about beadwork as literature. That's remarkable. Like, that's a remarkable part of, of, of this life here at the University of Manitoba. And that, that's what I mean when I'm saying that is fulfilling the vision of the Oshki Anishinaabe. And a large segment of that involves writing and text and our ability to go out and become dentists and, and business people. And just host about an hour ago a language revitalization panel uh, on bringing together, for the first time in history, our department was able to teach four languages this year. That's what the Oshki Anishinaabe looks like. It is a process of and, or that's a process of spontaneity. We're constantly becoming. Now, I don't want to traumatize anyone with this next slide, but um, here we go. <laughs> the world may not be ready for that. Like, we live in a world in which there is finite resources and only, uh, and we have exponential, never-ending, eternal hunger for those resources. That is a recipe for death, in which we don't have enough water, we don't have enough land, and we don't have enough air to be able to last forever. If we don't replace those things and care for those things, nurture those things, because free trade increases, pipelines are built, uh, people continue to make more and more profit as if there is no finiteness. And that's the biggest concern, is that we have here, I would say, that we have within our life. My daughter is a climate change activist, and she's, she is a 13-year-old girl who says the following, I don't want to have kids, Daddy, because I don't want them to be cursed to a life of death. I don't want to go to school, Daddy, because I don't want to learn about polar bears when there's not too many polar bears left. And Daddy, what's it going to be like when we run out of water? Like, that's the conversations I'm having with my daughter. And these aren't, these aren't facades. These are real-life conversations. There's more and more struggle happening as the land seeks to take resources. Uh, Victoria Tolle Corpus uh, is the UN Special Rapporteur for Indigenous People. And what she says is, what you're seeing throughout the world is what's called ethnic conflicts. Like, for example, the Kurds in Turkey at the moment is a good example. Or we might talk about the Middle East, we can talk about South Africa, we talk about Nigeria, we can talk about Zimbabwe. You'll see what's called ethnic conflicts throughout the world. Those aren't ethnic conflicts. What they are, she says, is they are indigenous peoples standing up for their own territories. Almost exclusively. And most often against multinationals, seeking to take lands and resources, often unjustly, and with the cooperation of state governments. Now, this is a big concern because uh, the reality is that we're seeing this everywhere. Uh, these are indigenous peoples in the Philippines, indigenous peoples in Colombia, sorry, Colombia's right here, and indigenous peoples in North America. And we can see this at the forks. You know, does anyone remember uh, Standing Rock? Remember Standing Rock? Uh, so Standing Rock, of course, was the issue involving a pipeline that was being built at Standing Rock. Thousands of people traveled there. They moved them anyways, arrested them, and then eventually built the pipelines anyways. Now this was a to totem pole that was coming from the Lumbee territory that came and uh, spent time in Winnipeg. We blessed it, we walked with it, and then we sent it on its way to Standing Rock. Now, turns out that pipeline they built broke, and ecological devastation. So everything people were worried about came true. Now, my daughter says to me when the pipe, when the, sorry, when the totem pole is coming through this territory, she says, hey, Daddy, let's go to the march. And I'm like, why do we got to go to a march? We can go to two more tomorrow. That's life in Winnipeg. You literally go to four marches on a weekend, spend your whole life marching. I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to this one because like, we go to another one tomorrow or whatever. And she's like, Daddy, we have to go to this one. And I said, well, why do we go to this one? She said, well, this one's about standing rock. And I said, well, why, why this one? And she goes, Daddy, uh, remember my name. Now, my, uh, my daughter's name is Namichi Nibikwe. I greeted her at the beginning. I honored her because I talked about my past and my future. So, Namichi Nibikwe means the light that dances off the water. And it's a name that was given to her to honor the waters of Thunder Bay, so that she'd always have a place to go, but most importantly, that she'd always learn from the water. That it talks about refraction off the water. And she says to me, she says, Daddy, we got to go to the march because light can't dance off the water if there's oil in it. Okay, what is she trying to say to me? What she is saying is, is there's no point in me having this name if I don't stand up for the water. Because water has this amazing thing of traveling throughout the world, and uh, if one water source gets affected, they all get affected. 
That's the teaching that my daughter carries with her in every step of her life. We went to the march. Now, my daughter is not anti the Trudeau slash Trump slash Harper slash sheer economic agenda. Because frankly, it's all of right, the same agenda. Uh, my daughter is not the anti whoever is in office this week agenda. My daughter is not even really called, she wouldn't even call herself an environmentalist. She is a lifeist. She doesn't go marching because she's anti some neoliberal thing. <coughs> she is pro uh, the existence of water. I used to say pro life there. And I was like, oh, that's going to get confusing. So. <laughs> she is pro the existence of water. She's pro water. That's what she is. And so what she says is, is I am Anishinaabe. I have no choice but to go because it is about myself. So she's not protesting, she is protecting. And what is she protecting? She's protecting herself. She's protecting the future. And by default, she's protecting you. That's why she keeps saying, Daddy, let's go to the march. Now, every time we do that, the way it's interpreted by state governments is that we're protesters, that we're up to no good, or we're problems, or, or we're complainers. Now, this is Burnaby Mountain and Elsie Booktook. Uh, so Elsie Booktook's right here. Uh, this is, we're going to meet Elsie Booktook in just a minute. Uh, this is Burnaby Mountain. But like, I could just keep, now I'm a person who's in the media a fair bit. Uh, I do, I read a column for the Winnipeg Free Press. So I know hate mail very well. But there is an epidemic, I might call it an infection of ignorance, and at times acrim acrimony towards Indigenous peoples being anywhere in the mainstream. Every time we speak out, every time we speak, every time we present, there was one person who wrote a hate mail to the Winnipeg Free Press, and, uh, it, and he said this, Oh, since when did the Winnipeg Free Press become an Indian newspaper? Uh, they hired me. Like, like, you know how many non-Indigenous people there are? But suddenly when they hire me, suddenly it's an Indian newspaper. Uh, and then he also wrote, Every time I see the word Negon Sinclair, I turn the page. And I'm like, I really shook his world. I don't know what that was. But that's the kind of role, and those of you who work in media, and I'm sure Ruth can talk about this as well, um, when Indigenous peoples are in the media, for, the CBC couldn't even handle the commentary. It was so visceral and so reactive. And, and uh, you know, this is not the fact that media is doing particularly a good job sometimes, because we can't forget that we've all been called the most racist city in the galaxy by Maclean's magazine, which is probably the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. One is because it's a complete misreading of what's going on in Winnipeg. But then second is as soon as McLean's put up that magazine, Saskatoon put up their hand and was like, well, thank God we're not Winnipeg. <laughs> and I was like, have you been to Saskatoon? <laughs> a little bit of racism there. And most importantly is that like, like we can see it. It's very evident. So why didn't they send the reporter to Saskatoon? Why is it that then Vancouver went, well, you know, Winnipeg's a real problem, isn't it? And we're like, uh, aren't you the place in which the Picton trials took place? And then how about Toronto, the fact they send reporters to tell these egregiously incorrect stories about places like Winnipeg. Like, you know what Winnipeg is? We're the fastest growing urban indigenous population. That means that approximately 20% of us, to the tune of 50% if you include the people who are just claiming, meaning that if I took all of you and I shook your ancestor, if I shook your family tree, an ancestor would fall out of it, probably an indigenous one. So what that tells you is that probably 50% of indigenous people in Winnipeg have indigenous ancestry who they can claim if they choose to be claimed, if they choose to create relationships in order to be claimed. That means that if you are a dentist, if you are a business person, if you're a politician, you are engaging with indigenous peoples every day. The most employable skill you can have in Manitoba isn't learning how to be a plumber, it is learning how to work with indigenous people. If you don't know how to work with indigenous people, you're incompetent. Uh, you, you're unable to work. You send me hate mail in the middle of the day. I think, well, it's a big deal that you send me hate mail, whatever. But the bigger deal is, what do you like to work with? What do you like to live beside? Can you work in Winnipeg and not deal with Indigenous people? It's impossible. So what this tells you is that not only are Indigenous peoples the most important thing to remember, but that when we play the racism Olympics, there's no gold medals. Like, let's stop pretending like it's a like it's an Olympics. And then on the real front of it is, you know what the reality is? Winnipeg is the center of indigenous life in Canada, alongside places like Regina and Saskatoon. Winnipeg is not the most racist city in the galaxy. It is a place in which we have inherited Canadian racism, and we see it more here. That also tells you that we might just be the people coming up with the most solutions, Toronto reporter. Now, 
But framing Indians as problems is the Canadian pastime. It's like the Canadian hobby. It's like constantly going, oh, indigenous peoples don't make enough money, they don't get enough university degrees, they don't, they're not symbolizing fast enough, therefore they're the problem. I don't have to really explain to you, all you really have to go is like, how did that come from? Well, that comes from a historical ideology and the constant treatment of indigenous peoples as savage, deficient problems within the country. They don't civilize fast enough, they don't Christianize fast enough. And even when we build a system built hell-bent on doing that at all costs necessary, uh, we still they still aren't civilized enough. In 1907, my community, we were the most Christian indigenous settlement in Western Canada. We were also the most agriculturally successful settlement. We were better than all the other settler farmers, but yet they moved us off the land anyways, unjustly, illegally, to what's now Pegasus First Nation. That tells you that there is a long-standing ideology of treating indigenous peoples as the problem, and when they get when they get to be the problem, you just move them off the land. And if you say to yourself, well, maybe this is different, well, uh, I only have to show you what happened two weeks ago at the storms in Winnipeg. So what happened, uh, storms in Manitoba, what happened, there was a number, about a dozen or so towns in, in Manitoba that were without power, and about you know a dozen or so First Nations that were without power. Who did they move to the emergency shelter, and who did, whose communities did they fix first? And that tells you who are the problems, and who are the solutions. Or who are the savages, and who are the civilized. Who are those in which we're, we're perfectly fine with dumping them in an emergency unit, but who are we? We're like, we don't want to move them from the homes. So what I'm trying to tell you is that all that's still here. And it's still evident within the very fabric of the place in which we live. We're, we're built to believe that Indigenous peoples continue to be problems, continue to be the ones who are protesting and complaining, when we're not protesting and complaining at all. We are protecting. Like my daughter. We are people who are engaged, in an economy, we are engaged in a political system, uh, voting for reasons that are unbeknownst to me because the political parties have no solutions or interests in coming up with solutions, but yet we vote at the tune of 63%. Mind-blowing. Uh, I even wrote a column to go, don't be surprised indigenous peoples don't vote in the provincial election because the provincial leaders did nothing. They didn't say anything even. <laughs> uh, at least in the federal campaign, we were talked about for the first time in history. In the provincial campaign, we were completely invisible. All of this is within an ideology to say that there is uh, indigenous peoples are framed as the problems and that the solutions Canadians are taught to be superior, feel superior. Indigenous peoples are taught to feel ashamed. Now, this is all changing, but it's very slow. And it, it comes at a, it comes at a uh, kind of an ornamental degree. It come, for example, when I was in school, uh, the textbooks would have indigenous peoples as the first three pages. Now we get the first 20 pages. But then on page 21, it's still, boom, Cartier shows up, and then it's 450 pages of European amazingness. So I'm sure glad we got the 20 pages, but we still have the 450 pages where, did Amer Europeans do amazing things? Absolutely, amazing things. But yet, uh, indigenous peoples are still seen as ornaments to that amazingness. Now, all of this, may, you may be wondering, why are we giving this history on uh, on, hit on indigenous, non-indigenous relationships, or, or the ways we're ostracized in the country, or the fact that languages still aren't recognized by the federal government. We've been given an office, which will create bureaucracy, which is where all the money's going to go. That means no money's actually going to go to languages, it's going to go to fund bureaucracy, because the job of bureaucracy is to create more bureaucracy. Well, this is manifested in the current struggles that we can see right in front of us. The Trans Mountain Pipeline Extension, with the minority liberals who will be likely be propped up, on this issue, likely by the Conservatives, not so much by the NDP, although who knows, because uh, we can't forget, I think everybody forgets, that Jagmeet Singh came out in support of the pipeline in the early stages of his leadership of the NDP and then changed his tune uh, when the election came around. Uh, probably was influenced by people running for the election within the NDP. Um, this is going to be a pertinent issue that's going to really bring this conversation to the forefront. Are Indians the problem? Will they continue to be the problem? And how will Canada deal with that? Because we keep coming to a conversation time and time and time again. Since the 1960s, since the moment we were legally allowed to leave reserves, we've been marching over and over and over again. Marching, marching, marching. Now, in every single one of the marches, or what we might call <coughs> occupations, which is impossible to describe something as an occupation when people are standing on their own land. But anyways, so in those kind of moments, I just want you to think back and go, okay, so here's the Native People's Caravan, 1974. Here's the marches against the White Paper, 69. Uh, here's the marches to, uh, to have the audacity to challenge the government to say, federal government to say we should be able to parent our own children. 
1970s, and even up to Idle No More today. Every single march that you can remember in Canadian history, name me one time in which Indigenous peoples shot first. Can you name me one? Burt Church, Ipawash, Oka, these are ones in which they turned. There was some shooting involved, there was some people harmed. Name me one time Indigenous people shot first. You can't! <laughs> We've never done it. Uh, when, when there is uh, death, like the Dudley George, for example, in Ipawash, the Ontario police shot first. At Oka, the security in Quebec shot first. Burnt Church, Canada shot first. Like in every single one of these different instances, uh, when we are when we engage Canada, we are met with vociferous resistance. Now, once in a while, when there's a peaceful march like this, this is the march in June 2015 of the TRC. Um, every once in a while, you'll see kind of a sort of sense of inclusivity, but it's often at a time of sorrow. Like this is about residential schools. Um, what was the biggest march in Winnipeg history in recent memory? Well, recently it was the climate change marches, which was down in the legislature, but before that it was the march to honor Tina Fontaine's life. Do you remember that? 4,500 people, many of them non-Indigenous, marching with Indigenous people um, over a moment of sorrow. Uh, that's interesting, but what is it and what will that would, what will it be that will provoke change? Now, one of these guys is my dad. See if you can figure out which one it is. <laughs> now, my dad has been at this thing for a very long period of time, and I don't shy away by you know, offering that my father's Murray Sinclair, and, and he's been at this thing for a very long period of time. But here's one thing that I remember about my father. When I was a kid, uh, he used to take me up a court up in uh, Norway House or Oxford House or uh, you know, wherever, up, whatever First Nation we were up, usually Pegasus, actually. And uh, he'd take me up to court there, and he'd be there for all day. And this was like 1987, 1988. And, uh, and one thing that I was really blown away by is we'd walk into this uh, community center on a First Nation, usually the gym at the school, and there would be this wall of whiteness. The Crown Attorney was white, the RCMP, there'd be 10 of those, they'd, be all, they'd be all be white, the judge was white, the bailiff was white, the court reporter was white, all the media was white, and there would be my dad as the sole brown face in that room, except for the accused, mm -hmm. who he was representing. And, you know, every, and what does that tell you? My dad lost most of the time, because he did. He lost about, you know, 70, 80% of his cases. Most of the people that he represented ended up in jail, um, and that's no different than a lot of Indigenous peoples enter the justice system. Uh, and now today we've got 80% incarceration rate if you are 18 years old or below as an Indigenous person. If you are an Indigenous person generally, that's 38% of the national prison population. We only make up a couple percent of the uh, actual federal population. Um, if you are a young woman, uh, to the tune of 60, 70%. If you are a uh, indigenous parent, 80, 90 percent of your children removed during the child welfare. My point of it is, the justice system, the healthcare system, uh, the uh, the child welfare system. These are all systems that are meant for indigenous people. They're, the, the indigenous people are driven to these systems, and the justice system in particular resulted in my dad losing a lot of cases. He might not have been a great lawyer, but probably the thing that I really remember is he always kept going. And the other thing that I really remember is when we would finish a 12-hour day, now I was like 12 years old, you know what that was like, 12 hours sitting in a court? Not fun for me, but here's what I really remember. We got, my dad would say to me, okay, it's time to go. We'd go to the parking lot, and there would be about eight cookums holding their grandsons by the ear and saying, this is who's going to represent you. <laughs> and then they would say to my father, can you talk to us for a little while? And my dad would stay there for another three hours. So like 15 hours later, my visit with my dad was not really much of a visit, but, but that would be what my experience was growing up. What does that tell you? That tells you that uh, my dad, even though he lost, indigenous people still saw a possibility in an indigenous person within the system itself. And most importantly, somebody who knew his teaching, somebody who was working for our people, somebody who was bringing our teachings to the justice system, and that, my friends, is what reconciliation is all about. Whether he did it in Peglis or Oxford House or Norway House, this is what he also did with the TRC with Chief Wilton Littlechild, uh, Marie Wilson, and that's what the 94 Calls to Action are all about. They're meant to be in every single segment of the economy 
to say that indigenous peoples are going to be in your workplace. They're going to be your dentist. They're going to be your lawyer. They're going to be your business owner. If you go to the walk box, for example, or if you go to the horse track, or if you go to the conference hotels throughout downtown Winnipeg, indigenous peoples are a part of your life. And that's what he believed. That's what he saw. That's what he had also learned in the teachings themselves of the Ashki Anishinaabe. Now, every time we encounter that resistance or that uh, reaction or that, that um, we might call it racism, what do we do about it? Now, this is Elsie Booktook. Elsie Booktook is a fracking, uh, is a community, a Mi'kmaq community who had experienced fracking. Uh, New, New Brunswick government had found shale gas underneath their community. Um, underneath, uh, and then the, I don't know if you know what fracking is, but it's diagonal drilling involving fresh water, spraying fresh water, making the uh, oil come out, and which, which then is an ecological disaster for that area. Bottom line of it is this community did not want fracking on their territory. The New Brunswick government used clauses like under six inches of the soil, we claim that as crown land, you only as a reserve have title to the six inches, sort of thing like that. And they said, you got to deal with it anyways. We're sitting in the RCMP. And Elsie Booktuk said, no, we're going to stand in our own territory. We're going to face off against you. And this is what happened. sitting on that our First Nations claim or Indigenous claim, 
100% of it, that means every single dam, fence, pipeline, highway, has to have indigenous peoples at the table. But if this is what it comes to, the government said, we don't really care what you think anyways. But yet, remarkably, this is how indigenous peoples respond, not only by sacrificing themselves, but by doing this. To the exact same people who just a moment ago were threatening their life, two things, and then ultimately delivered those two things. 
One is the removal of indigenous territories. Second is the removal for the protection of waters for the purposes of resource extraction projects. And people in Saskatchewan, some people in this room, organized this on December 17, 2012. 4,000 people, 4,000 people going to a mall to dance. Not to flip a building or burn anything. I can tell you one thing that they're not doing. What are they not doing? Buying. When we had our march uh, four days later at Portage Place in Polo Park, when we organized that, we intentionally did it in the escalator area. And what is in the escalator area at Polo, Polo Park? At December 21st, 2012. It's still there every year. The Santa Castle. Now, what did Santa do when we began to round it? He left, because Santa's not ready for the round dance. <laughs> because it is ultimately that move towards consumption, purchase and profit, and the use of lands and resources at an exponential rate, the uh, swallowing of the world, that has led to what's divided us all. What's divided us into this massive situation at Elsie Booktook, or Burnaby Mountain, or a Trans Mountain, or whatever that might be, in the very downtown streets of Winnipeg. Um, that's what's led us to this division, is this have and have nots, profit, uh, consumption. It's this constant s struggle in which indigenous peoples are the problem because they have, they have the audacity to believe in the future, to argue for land and water, to be like my daughter and say that I am protecting myself and by default you by standing up and organizing the climate strike down at the legislature. And that, my friends, that is the Oshki Anishinaabe. That is what we are bringing to creation, is this constant series of love, generosity, peace, and this remarkable belief in that tomorrow is a possibility. Because tomorrow is a chance to become spontaneous, to continue to become the spontaneous people. So I say huge miigwech, and thank you very much for uh, listening to me. And uh, I don't know if we have time to hang out or anything like that, but if we're finished, then we're finished. So miigwech, thank you.